Good morning. How's everybody doing? Good, good. Y'all came back even though we don't have ice cream this week. That's nice. That's good. Uh, we do have ice cream next week, though, for those of you who are disappointed. So uh, come back, check it out. It's going to be a special weekend next week. So um, whatever plans you have, you should just change those so that you can be here. Uh, my name is Danny. I'm one of the pastors here at Kesed, and uh, I'm honored that you're here. We're in a series right now called Hearsay and Heresy. And uh, throughout this year, uh, in order to kind of help us understand a little bit more about who God is and, and who he reveals himself to be in scripture, we have leaned into something called iconography. Iconography is the use of icons or symbols to better understand who God is. And uh, this whole year, we've built different trees using the artists in our church for each series to represent uh, kind of a, a way in which we can understand God. And this is our hearsay and heresy tree. Um, the theory is within the tree that uh, the organic parts of the tree, the, the parts that look like everyday trees that, that we've all grown up around, those are the parts of uh, creation that God has just uh, defined and built and made. And those trees will live out their life cycles according to the will of God, uh, as will much of our lives and much of the way that, that we, of course, operate in our, uh, in our personhood. But within all of our stories, uh, oftentimes we come up with a lot of our own ideas about how we should live our lives, our own theories about what is true and what is not, about what is real and what is not. And those are represented by the electric lights that we've woven into this tree. And so within a series on hearsay and heresy, what we're really doing is parsing out uh, what is true, what is organic, what is from the creator, and what is man-made or man-invented that, that we think would make a tree a little more trendy or a little more uh, beautiful or a little more effective or just altogether better. So that's what this represents. And today you're going to need, uh, you're going to need that mindset and a little bit of curiosity because today we're going to talk about one of the most complex uh, spiritual doctrines within our faith, and that is uh, the doctrine or belief in the Trinity. Uh, now, there's lots of different ways we could approach this, and there's much better teachers than I, um, but I decided to teach you about how I engage with the Trinity in my own personal life. There are, again, commentaries, studies, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years worth of work on how to break this down into a way that is understandable. And so today is going to be really straightforward and for some of you somewhat simple, but my hope is, at least based on the last few experiences preaching it, that uh, it might be uh, a little different than you've ever held before. And that is because I'm really not that complex. And so when I read scripture, uh, I have a really interesting approach to it because I read it really slow. It's just the way that my mind works. I read it in full color. It's just the way my mind works. And I often am impacted by parts of it that, uh, that are personal to me. So in order for this message to work, here's what that means. That means you're going to have to slow down just a little bit. You're going to have to really let these passages into your brains. And you are going to have to, some of you, set down uh, some of the, the preconceived ideas, maybe the hearsay, around how you think the Trinity works and why. And I believe it's going to be a beautiful exercise. And I think in the end, uh, we will all find ourselves maybe sitting uh, with it with a little different perspective than we had when we came in. Amen? Uh, all of the doctrines that we're walking through throughout the series can be approached really two ways, close-handed or open-handed. Close-handed would be uh, anything outside of this is heresy, like you can't get to heaven except through Jesus. If you're like, no, no, there's many ways to get through Jesus. We would say, according to biblical doctrine, that's heresy. Uh, and open-handed would be some of the other topics that we are uh, going to be dealing with within the series. Uh, when it comes to the Trinity... And the Christian faith, it's a straightforward, close-handed doctrine. This is how God presents himself. Now, your first argument may be, um, excuse me, Pastor Danny, uh, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. There's lots of words that aren't in the Bible. So just relax, okay? What we're doing is understanding and watching how God introduces himself in the Bible over and over and over. And you will see very quickly that it is Trinitarian in all of its forms. Uh, first, just for some context, the word Trinity literally means three in one. 
Uh, here's a typical image that tries its best to explain it from a theological standpoint. You've probably seen this before. We've taught it here before. The Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not the Son. The, whole, the Son is not the Father, and yet they are all God. Now, this is a, a really important image for us to understand because uh, the first thing I think for me that I've had to do when wrestling with the Trinity is confess that I connect to different aspects of uh, the, the Godhead depending on the season I'm in, and I think that's okay. Uh, when my parents went through a divorce many, many years ago, I needed a father really bad. And up until then, God was kind of an enigma to me, but he very much became uh, the father I needed during that season when uh, my dad was no longer around. Uh, when I got married... For the first few years, uh, I was confused at how to do that well. And I got to tell you, Jesus became a brother that I, could, that I could sit with out on our little patio and be like, why did you make her this way? And what is wrong with her? <laughs> and me, and me, because he's a good brother that way. He, I, he, it's just a partnership that I had that I, I hadn't had before. And I can tell you as a church planter uh, and, and pastor that I am privileged to uh, do for, for a living the Holy Spirit has never been more evident in my life than he is right now as I need a guide. I need somebody that helps me with these different crossroads, these different experiences. So I want to say right away that if you have connected in your spiritual faith or if you have a leaning towards one over the other, I don't think that's a, a bad thing. I don't think it's inappropriate. I think as a matter of fact, it's one of the beautiful aspects of the God that we serve. But I will say that if you don't understand the full triune God, you are missing something inside his nature and therefore something in the relationship that he is trying to develop in you. In the past, the church fathers have deemed the Trinity, anything outside of it, as I said, heresy. And yet it's so complex that a lot of churches don't teach it very often. They often ignore it. And the problem is, is then by ignoring it, you end up building heretical teaching. And that's why it's so important to face it, to sit with it, to be curious about it, uh, despite how complex it is. And because we don't shy away from much around here at Kesed, that's exactly what we're going to do. So let's start out with one agreeable, uh, I think, truth when it comes to discussing the Trinity, and that will be it. That will be this. None of us will be able to fully wrap our minds around the concept of the Trinity. And that is not a bad thing. This is beyond most of us. Actually, it's beyond all of us. But it's beyond most of us when it comes to our theological humility, meaning there are points it feels like we finally grasp it. And I think you should enjoy that season. If you've ever just been like, I got it. I finally got it. It's like an egg. And you're like, it's a shell and the white and the yolk and they're all different, but they're all the same. I got it. And then you grow in your faith and you're like, it's nothing like an egg. Someone told me last service, it's like time, past, present, future. All are different, but all are time. And you're like, yeah, it's like time. Then you grow in your faith and you're like, it's nothing like time. Like as you continue to evolve in your faith, you will have seasons where you grasp it and frankly, you will have seasons where it is beyond you. And again, I think that's on purpose. C.S. Lewis said, if Christianity were something we were making up, of course we would make it easier. But it is not. We cannot compete in simplicity with people who are inventing religions. C.S. Lewis was kind of rude sometimes. I know it's eloquent, but if you really read some of his writings, sometimes he's just like, and cut your throat, right? He just... <laughs> Like, we can't compete with you, pagan sir, because you invented the whole thing. We're dealing with facts, and that is the fact that God introduces himself in this Trinitarian way. He says, we are dealing with fact. Of course, anyone can be simple if he doesn't have any facts to bother about. <laughs> Basically, God is bigger than us, and he'll always be bigger than us, which means our minds will always be expanding to try and conceive him. Not to mention... The Trinitarian nature of the creator is difficult for us to hold because we are taught generally to see things as plural or singular in nature. And yet we have examples of things that are both. For instance, your family. It is your family. It is an individual unit, but it is also a collection of individuals. Or your favorite sports team. It is one. It is, this is who I'm a fan of, and yet it's a collection of individuals and, of course, church. So we do it subconsciously all the time. It's just that when we put the word God on it, suddenly we're like, no, 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 I, I, I don't know if I can engage that way. And yet we are challenged to. 
Another reason we struggle to hold the Trinitarian nature of the creator well is because we have a limited ability to perceive beyond our own experience. I don't know if you've ever been to another country where they do like practices that are just radically different than the way you do practices, but it accomplishes the same thing. And you're like, why? Like, I didn't even conceive this is how people would operate or this is how people would think. And if you've traveled at all, that's one of the benefits of travel is you suddenly realize your conception of how things are is just your reality. It's not the reality. For instance, when it comes to conceiving size, right? Really, really conceptualizing size. Uh, we all have seen trees, right? Trees, trees, trees. But did you ever see the redwood trees and really then understand how small the trees are that we have here? Once you see redwood trees, I remember seeing them as a kid. I was like, oh, our trees are lame. And our trees are great. But when you see them just compared to size to the redwood trees, you're like, oh, oh okay, uh, that's a big tree. These are not as big trees. Now, I think everyone in this room, whether you've seen redwood trees or not, would, would be able to look at the image of a man in the tree and go, well, that's a big tree. But what about when I talk to you about our earth and the size of our earth? Now, we all had science in school. We all were told all the different facts about the size of our earth. But recently, uh, someone came out with, or at least I heard it recently, that in spite of like the depths of the, the trench in the ocean or the Grand Canyon or the height of Everest, our church, our uh, earth is so large and so big that if you shrunk it down to the size of a marble, you would never feel any of those deviations on its surface. That it would be smoother than the smoothest marble that man could make. That's how huge our planet is. What about earth compared to the sun? Because earth is huge, right? Not compared to the sun. Like it's that little, like the font is bigger than our earth uh, symbol on there. That's a, that's a fairly big gaseous ball. And you're like, yeah, I get it. I get it. It's big. Earth is big. Sun is big. Okay, how about our sun compared to the biggest sun that they've compared, that they found? Hmm. This slide doesn't even do it justice because it's just in the black after that little tiny arrow that says our sun. Like, how do you even conceive the size of that? And so when we're wrestling with God and who he is, some of this mindset has to be allowed in. If you can't wrap your mind around it, it is because the Trinity didn't come from man. Man would not have come up with it. This is because man could not fully conceive it. We are constantly, by the way, invited by the creator to hold space for that which we cannot fully conceive. Over and over and over and over, we are asked by God to hold space with him while he describes things beyond our ability to understand, which is why it's confusing sometimes when we come up against theological things we don't understand and we're like, well, then it must just not be true or it must be this way or it must be that way or your mind just can't understand it. How about how about somebody like Job? If I said to you, Job was a guy in the Bible who had a couple bad days. Those of you who grew up in church, you know that like Job, Job had a few years of bad days. He... Mm, mm, mm. See, this is how we should respond to the Holy Spirit people. We should engage. We should engage. Okay, he had a series of bad days and, and months of bad days and eventually he lost his family, he lost his health, he lost his wealth, he lost his reputation and he got down to this place where basically all that was left in his life, think about how bad this bad day is. Everything's gone and the only people left in your life are some lame friends that keep blaming you for everything happening and a cranky wife. Anybody been there? Anybody been there? <laughs> My wife's in service, it's fine, just relax. He has this place where he has nowhere to go. So he goes before God and he decides to tell God all of his thoughts. He tells God about his anger. He tells God about his frustration. He tells God about how he's let him down. He tells God all the things about all the ways that God isn't who he thought he was. And then God decides to respond. And so in the midst of a whirlwind, it says the Lord answered Job and his questions and accusations. Job chapter 38. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? 
Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Or what were the bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? And then my favorite verse, section of verses in this, in this chapter is verse 16 through 18. God continues, have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare if you know all this. See, God's calling out of Job in the midst of Job's complaints and questions and, and accusations and frustration and grief and all the things to this bigger place of Job, I am beyond you. I am beyond your circumstances. I am beyond your story. I am beyond even your pain, your joy, and all that you can conceptually understand. And yet I am willing to meet you in the midst of this place. And so I just wanna say before I move on in the message for this room and whoever's watching, some of the stuff that you're going through in your life right now, it is beyond you. And you have been continuing in it because you're waiting for answers. You're waiting to solve it like an arithmetic problem that you're trying to get, get the answer to. And that's just not how you're going to get through it. That's just not what's next. Instead, what I would love for you to do is do what Job did and just find a place and tell God every single thing you're feeling. Tell him all of it. You don't even have to use churchy language. You can use that language you use when no one's around. <laughs> yep, you can. God can handle that. He's bigger than that. God, I think Job probably used some language in his day that other people were like, you cannot say that. And Job's like, I'm saying it all. Have you seen this boil on my face? <laughs> you are called and I am called to be in relationship with God. And that means you get to bring your full self. And I just want to say, it says towards the end of the book of Job that God honored Job's prayers and told his friends, the lame ones that were trying to blame him for all the stuff going on in his life, that they should probably ask Job to pray for them if they don't want stuff to go sideways in their own life. And I think it's profound that God honored the broken, angry, cursing, frustrated, angsty, fearful prayers of a man who was suffering by saying, I'm gonna meet you in that space and I'm gonna pull you into relationship with me that is beyond your understanding because I think when you sit in the beyond, there is comfort when that beyond belongs to God. Amen. For me, I have found great comfort in the beyond in this idea that, that God wants to, uh, to see me, that he wants to know me. And so... I, uh, I have kind of sat in this place of realizing that the word I think the, the Bible uses to call us into this place of beyond is behold. The creator is constantly calling us to behold his presence. For instance, the baptism of Christ is probably the easiest place to see the beholding God is calling us into. Matthew 3, and when Jesus was baptized... Listen to, the, to the, uh, symbol, the symbols, the iconography in this. Immediately he went up from the water and behold, the heavens were open to him and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. This is the clearest picture we have of the creator. We have the voice from heaven, okay? We have the dove coming down and we have the sun coming up from the water. This is, this is the triune God fully presence. All three persons of the creator are sitting before us in a way that we can behold. We call this beholding God. That's what's going on here. This is the best container we can come up with for what we are experiencing here. In other words, Trinity is a Christian name for God. The word God is the word we use for the relationship of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And the baptism of Christ is showing us that God exists as three relational beings that he is constantly trying to remind us he doesn't just do relationship, he is relationship. And what I believe we are seeing in scripture, if we look for it, if we read it slowly, if we allow it to come to life, is God constantly pulling us into a posture like Job of beholding his beyondness. So let's take like Old Testament stuff. 
like straightforward Sunday school stuff, like the story of Samson. Samson was a judge. There was a time when there was basically the Holy Spirit would fall on people and those people would guide nations and they would use prophets sometimes, God would, and he would use judges. And judges went around and guided people, protected people and so forth. And so Samson was a judge that God was going to use from birth. As a matter of fact, from birth, he was called into a lifestyle known as the Nazarite vow. Let's read it in Judges 13 verses one and five. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. There was a certain man of Zorah of the tribe of the Danites whose name was Manoah and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Therefore, be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. Now, the Nazarite vow came long before Samson. The Nazarite vow was a way for men or women to set themselves into a posture of relationship with God so that God could reveal more of who he was since he's beyond us all. There are three primary things in the Nazarite vow and there always have been and they've never changed. The first one is you can't drink wine. Some of you are like, I'm out. Clearly not called to be a Nazarite. The next thing you can't do is touch dead things of any kind. The third thing you can't do is cut your hair. And so those three things for a season, generally people would take a year or or however long, a season where they would dedicate themselves before God who is beyond them. And they would say, God, I'm gonna set down these things so that I can have relationship with you so you can reveal yourself to me. Now, people didn't come up with this. They weren't like, you know, it'd be really neat. It'd be really neat if we just figured out a way to like, like, like really make ourselves different than everybody else. So what we're gonna do is not touch dead stuff. Like no one came up with that. God gave this to Moses and then Moses passed it on and it's been passed on ever since. God gave no wine, God gave no hair. This was God's idea. He could have done anything. He could have been like, hey, you're gonna go to church more. You're not gonna farm or you're gonna farm more or you're gonna give all your stuff away to the poor for a year or you're gonna, or you're gonna, but these are the things he chose. And I've always been curious about it until I started looking for the Trinity story within all stories of the Bible. First off, don't drink wine. Because wine influences. Now we're going to New Testament, Ephesians 5. Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Is this early covenant pointing to who the Holy Spirit is and that he should be the primary influence within our lives? So it's a symbol of a way in which we engage with a part of God that influences us. And so God is saying not that wine is sinful or not that wine is in any way bad, especially during this culture or time or even today. But if wine is something you can set down in order to heighten your influence, I wonder if symbolically God's introducing a part of who he is through this covenant. What about don't touch anything dead? As we know, the people of God are called to seek life. First John 5, and this is the testimony that God gave us, eternal life. And this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life. Whoever does not have the son of God does not have life. Is this pointing to who Jesus is as the bringer of life everlasting? Is he like, hey, don't touch dead things as a reminder of the fact that all of us are dead without Jesus who we touch. What about the next one? Don't cut your hair. Scripture is full of all sorts of outward uh, ways in which we are called to set ourselves apart. Second Timothy, by the way, all these are New Testament verses tying to Old Testament verses. Hopefully you're putting that together. They're, they're, that way you don't disqualify me because I'm only preaching from the Old Testament, like some of the emails you send. <laughs> Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Is this part of the Nazarite vow pointing to who the father is and how he asks us to set ourselves aside for his ways and his will? In other words, is the vow just another way to behold God? Who wants to influence us, who wants to touch us with everlasting life, and who wants to set us apart so that we can live holy and in relationship with him. 
well, that's one lucky story, Danny. Maybe you're just tying stuff together because this is what you do for a living. Fair enough. Can he do it again? Yes, he can. (laughs) Another Old Testament story. What about Elijah the prophet? This one should be on the nose for everybody. Elijah's now a judge. uh, Samson was a judge. Elijah's a prophet. So a different branch, right, of God moving through his spirit. God uses Elijah in this really powerful way. He uses him to confront an entire nation that's just riddled with all kinds of electric thinking. So he stands before them and he goes, here's the deal. We'll have a prophet off. You bring your prophets. I'll bring myself. And you, you make an altar and I'll make an altar and then we'll pray and see whose God brings fire from heaven. And so this is what they do. And they have their prophet off. That's, that's, not, that's not Hebrew or anything. I just invented that in case you're wondering. You're like, hmm, prophet off. That must be... That must be deep. No, it's not. They're just prophet offing. These guys bounce around, call fire from heaven. Elijah mocks them the whole time, even makes fun of their God and asks if maybe he's not paying attention because he's relieving himself. Elijah was a baddie. Like he he was not, he was not, uh, he was not as soft as we like to imagine a lot of our prophets. And then he stood before them all and he goes, all right, my turn. And he steps up and he says, God of gods, do your thing. And fire falls from heaven and eats like the the bull and the wood and the stones and the earth and everything else around it. And then Elijah with his beard, just a little bit on fire. (laughs) That's how I like to imagine it. Just a little bit on fire and kind of smoky. Turns to all the prophets, turns to all the people and says, get rid of them. And they kill all those false prophets. But the queen of those false prophets gets really frustrated because people don't like it when you kill their systems of thinking. So she sends a really mean letter. She basically cancels him and he becomes afraid. And so he runs out into the desert so far that there's no way back. I don't know if you've ever put this together, but Elijah tried to kill himself. He was suicidal. So for those in the room who've ever wrestled with suicidality and you think, well, if I was filled with the spirit, that would never happen. If I really trusted God, that would never happen. There's no way I could find myself in this place because if I really believed in God, that would never happen. It's just all false religion. That's not true because Elijah called fire from heaven and a week later, he's like, I want to die. Because to be human sometimes is to get caught up in your humanness, especially when you can't see what's beyond you. So God shows up with Elijah and he does what, we, what all really should happen with everybody that gets into these really dark spaces. He tells him to take a nap and then gives him a snack. That's what he does. It's, read it. It's what he does. He's like, just go to sleep. Here's some crackers, right? And then he wakes up and he's like, you ready to talk to me? And he's like, no, no. Okay, more crackers. Go back to sleep. This is what he does. You can read it. I'm not making this stuff up. Finally, his strength returns. He's like, okay, maybe God does see me. God's like, let's have a conversation, but not here. So Elijah goes to a cave. He gets to this cave and he, of course, is ashamed of himself, probably ashamed of the desert time, ashamed of the fear. He realizes that the people have turned from him. And so he, at this point, just doesn't know how he's going to exist. And there in that place, God shows up. First Kings 19. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord and the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant. This is very Job. Thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And even I, I only am left. And they seek to take my life. Verse 11, and he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by in a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. I've preached this passage many, many times, especially as a youth pastor, because this passage sells hard. (laughs) People love this stuff, especially students, especially young people. They're like, all right, all right. So God shows up at things you can see and touch, but it's kind of scary because God's kind of big. And I always skip over this. I have till recently. I've always skipped over this idea that it says God was not in all of those things because I couldn't really explain the fact that of course God's in those things, but clearly God is highlighting that that's not the thing he's in. <laughs> like, it's not like Elijah's there and then it happened to be a forest fire on the mountain. And God's like, well, I could use that. And then a moment later, there's a quake. God's like, well, I suppose I could use that too. If only I had, and then there's wind. God's like, what? Crazy. Of course God's in all those things, all of them. And yet it highlights, God is like, nope, not fully me. Oh, quake, not fully me. Oh, wind, not fully me. And so I've come to question, could this cave experience be another way in which we are called to behold the individual persons of God? 
And so I was wanting to, I really wanted this to work, right? I got all the way to this part of the message and I was like, is there any way I can tie this together? Sometimes I start at the end so I know where I'm going. This one just flowed. And then I got to this and I was like, I don't know if I can tie all this to, to, to all the New Testament passages, but I'm gonna try. Could it be that the great wind represents the Holy Spirit who stirs the hearts of his children? And I found Acts. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Hmm. Then the earthquake. And I was like, there is an earthquake verse somewhere in here about God, the father, the voice of God or something being an earthquake. Could the earthquake represent the father in heaven? And I found it. Revelation 16, the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man on the earth. So great was that quake. The problem in message building is it left me with fire and Jesus. And I was like, Jesus isn't a fire. Jesus is like a warm blanket. <laughs> like Jesus isn't fire. So if wind, wind works and God's introducing an earthquake works, I don't know what I'm gonna do with this Jesus thing. And then Luke showed up. 12, verse 49 and 50. These are red letters from Jesus, the man himself. I came to cast fire on the earth and would that it were already kindled. I have a baptism to be baptized with and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Could it be that the entire three elements that we're experiencing, just like the three elements within the Nazarite vow are once again, God saying, I'm a lot of this, but not all that. I'm a whole lot of this, but that's not all me. I'm a lot of that, but that's not everything. Could it be that God is constantly calling us to behold what we can understand so that we can sit in a place beyond ourselves so that like Elijah, we can move forward in our place of hiding, confessing our deepest feelings, knowing that God will meet us in the midst of it. Now, the, the Elijah story is perfect for this because do you know what ends up drawing him the rest of the way out of the cave? Because see, God told him to stand at the mouth of the cave. I don't know if you ever put it together, but he wasn't fully obedient. We know that because here in a second, he's gonna actually go all the way to the mouth. And I think that's because when you approach God with only one aspect, you can never fully get into the relationship with him you need to. And so if you're a fire God person, like fire's pretty hot. So you're like, I love the fire part of Jesus. The problem is the fire part of Jesus burns you too. You're like, no, I want God to quake people's foundations. I want him to break them apart for him. Problem is you're gonna be broken apart too. What about people who just love to just sit in the spirit till their hair is just, you know, frolicking in his presence. They're just looking around for other windblown Christians all the time. That's all they care about. Just Christians that look like they drive around with nothing but their windows down and sunroof open. And if you're really truly Pentecostal, convertible all day long. <laughs> just the bigger spiritual hair you got, the better. The problem is, <laughs> some. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But the problem is we all know those people and everything is like windy, all their conversations. And the earthquake people especially are like, foundation. And the fiery people are like, how do you guys sleep at night without any warmth of Jesus in your heart? And we sit in this triune relationship of religion, wondering why nobody else gets it like us. Because we're not really at the foot of the cave like God asks us to be. But Elijah would be coaxed out. And after the fire, the sound of a whisper. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and look at it, went and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, what are you doing here, Elijah? Perhaps God is the whisper who pursues us wherever we flee to. Could it be that within each of these wondrous stories, God is sharing a part of himself with us so that we may behold more of who he is? Perhaps he's in the mystery. When we built this message, we do it a lot as pastors. And Pastor Chandra said this, she goes, isn't this always where we find relationship with God at the intersection of understanding and wonder? See, the Trinity matters because it drives us into that mystery, into that wondrous relationship. And so that's what's at risk if it's misplaced. Relationship with God. Because you become about one aspect of him. 
You become about the fire or the quake or the wind instead of becoming about the whisper. And here's the problem when you become about one, when I become about one aspect of God, that's who I mimic. So I become fire or quake or, or wind when in reality, I'm supposed to be a representative of the whisper of God in the lives of the people I meet, whether that's at the grocery store or that's at work or that's sitting with someone or at a coffee shop or walking down the street. My job's not to quake everybody, burn everybody and, and create great wind inside the lives of everybody. My job is to just whisper God's presence, which means it could be a smile. It could be a handshake. It could be not being shocked when they share about something they're going through. It could be being somebody who doesn't gossip and can hold space and private information. It could be prayer and on and on. I don't know what your whisper is. That's not my job. What I do know is if you're only quaking, right? If you're only bringing great wind, if you're only burning, then you are missing out out on being the full presence of God and so am I in people's lives. We cannot have relationship with God outside of the Trinity to believe anything else is heresy. Tozer said that really famous quote about what comes into our minds when we think about God as the most important thing about us. If the Trinity is the first thing that comes into your mind when you think about God, I guarantee based on biblical truth, it will change your relationships. You'll become fundamentally more caring, more self-giving, more sacrificial. You will find people in the midst of their hiding spaces. God will call you into their lives in order to display his full presence within their stories. But we make it too complex. We make it too much. And then we ourselves lose sight of it. And along the way, we forget that we were called to be children of God in the first place. Um, I was aware that when I was building this message that there were, there's better teachers here for stuff like this. Uh, I am much more story driven. I would be probably what you would typically call a preacher. Somebody like Joe, who just did an amazing job in the Bible last week, would kill this message from a technical standpoint. But... Um, I felt like I was supposed to do it. And at first I was frustrated with that because I was like, hey, I'm, we really pride ourselves in saying, God, let's use the best skill sets for the best messages and the people who were built for certain things. And it just felt like it was supposed to be me. And I was like, why would I preach the most complex one in the world? I tell stories for a living. And then during worship on Thursday, um, it was just a beautiful moment like it was today. And I got this presence because I, I don't normally feel anxious before I speak, but I was feeling a little bit like, I'm gonna disappoint people. I'm not gonna cover all the, the, the church fathers and the way we got here and the way that they discovered and all these other aspects that people like to believe inside their Trinitarian theology is important. And I was sitting in the back and it was like the third song in and I felt this immediate presence where God was like, Danny, just introduce me to them. And I was like, God, I, I don't like... I, I don't have the words and, and this, is, this is where it became from because behold is all throughout this message, but the word beyond is not. Because in the back, God was like, Danny, just introduce me. And I was like, God, it is beyond me. And he was like, exactly. And so I got comfortable and I decided that I was gonna preach the message. And I don't do this a lot, but for really one person in the room, and uh, it's profound to me that uh, he's here today because Kingston, who's sitting right over here in the front row, didn't even know that on Thursday, that's who God laid on my heart to, to build the message for. And Kingston is 13 years old and he always dresses to the, to the nines. He's always looking really sharp. And that's why we connect so well, probably, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we talk a little bit. And so... Uh, Kingston doesn't even know this. I asked uh, his dad if he could come up and just sit just for a second. So Kingston, do you care? Can you sit right here with me? Would you mind? Yeah, he didn't even know we're doing this. It's just this service. You can just sit here. Um, I believe that uh, God wants to introduce himself in these deep, rich ways that, that, that our children, even our sharp-dressed children like Kingston, um, can understand. And I believe that, that God is not uh, 
working a plan in order for us to, to try and achieve some great understanding. I believe that what Elijah discovered is what I discovered is what Kingston is or will discover. And that is that God will find you right where you are, that he will introduce himself fully to you, that he will, um, he will meet you and that he will bring his entire self, even if it's beyond your or my ability to understand. And so I don't know if you're impacted by this message. And I, I with great respect, I don't really care. <laughs> because the Holy Spirit is the one who guides me and I hope guides you. And my goal was that Kingston and other people Kingston's age would be able to go, okay, so sometimes there's going to be fire in my life. Sometimes it's a little bit God, but not all the time. And sometimes there's going to be wind in my life. And sometimes it's God, but not all the time. And sometimes there's going to be earthquakes in my life, but not all the time, but sometimes... It's God, but I do know this, that no matter where Kingston goes, no matter where you go, uh, God will whisper his presence to your story. And I think Kingston knows that God loves him just as he is. And he loves you just how you are. And I think that's a really important, special thing that the Trinity is supposed to bring to us when we allow ourselves just to be children in his presence. So that's my hope that you could be introduced to the full facet of God. You don't have to get rid of your fire God or your quake God or your wind God, but you're missing something if you don't let the rest of it in and sit before him like a curious child who's willing to, to wrestle with something beyond himself. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you uh, for who you are. I thank you for the way that you find us. I thank you for the people that you bring into our stories. I thank you for the way you introduce yourself to us right where we are, as we are, exactly what we are uh, dealing with and, um, and within the path that we're traveling. I pray, God, that we would all be uh, more like Kingston, curious and uh, interested and willing I pray, Lord, that, uh, that that would be the example of, uh, of what it means just to be a child in your presence that we can all touch even when we face large and complex issues like this one. We thank you for the relationship you offer. My prayer, Lord, is that we are willing to wrestle with it the rest of this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks, guys, for coming. Can we give Kingston a hand for just being drug up under the light? <laughs> all right, God bless. We'll see you next weekend.